The gospel lesson for today, thank you. The gospel lesson for today comes from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, at the conclusion of this series on being a good neighbor, we lay our lives down again before you, asking you to pick them up, to use what we offer, our presence, our abilities, even our faults and our foibles. Take what we offer the gifts of our lives, and weave them together, making something beautiful and good, showing forth your love and your light for all of the world. In Christ's name, amen. I was dating a young woman in college before Sarah, and as the relationship progressed through its different stages, at one point we talked about what's next. And the topic of marriage came up. And there was a ho-hum kind of attitude from the young lady I was dating. And I said, well, what's that about? And she goes, well, I mean, you're good enough. which wasn't enough. <laughs> this week, we're concluding the sermon series about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Reverend Rogers' message of love and acceptance accompanied a deep perfectionist streak, but it was also fueled by self-doubt and even anger that sometimes his work was not good enough. He felt keenly all that was wrong with the world and all that was wrong within himself. And he often voiced those fears through the character of Daniel the Tiger. And in the documentary, you will see that more than any other character, it was Daniel the Tiger who was the embodiment of Mr. Rogers himself. And in this little clip we're about to watch, Daniel Tiger asks, Am I a, a mistake? Let's watch this clip. You know something, Lady Abela? What, Daniel? I've been wondering about something myself. Something about Mr. Skunk? Something about mistakes. What is it? I've been wondering if I was a mistake. If you were a mistake, mm -hmm. what do you mean, Daniel? Well, for one thing, I've never seen a tiger that looks like me. No. And I've never heard a tiger that talks like me. No. 
and I don't know any other tiger who lives in a clock. No, neither do I. Or loves people. Oh, Daniel. Sometimes I wonder if I'm too tame. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a mistake. I'm not like anyone else I know when I'm asleep or even awake. Sometimes I get to dreaming that I'm just a fake. I'm not like anyone else. Others I know are big and are wild. I'm very small and quite tame. Most of the time, I'm weak and I'm mild. Do you suppose that's a shame? Oh, no. Often I wonder if I'm a mistake. I'm not supposed to be scared, am I? Sometimes I cry and sometimes I shake. Wondering, isn't it true that the strong break. I'm not like anyone else I know. I'm not like anyone else. I think you are just fine as you are. I really must tell you I do like the person that you are becoming. dreaming or breaking there's no one mistaking it you're my best friend i think you are just fine as you are i really must tell you i do like the person that you are becoming when you are sleeping when you are waking you're not a fake, you're no mistake, you are my friend. I wonder if I you am are a just mistake. fine as you are. I'm not like anyone I really else. must I tell you I do when I'm asleep like or even away. Sometimes I get to dreaming that when I'm just you a are sleeping, fake, I'm not like when you Most of the time, breaking, I'm there's weak no one and I'm dead. Do you suppose that's a shame? Friend, I wonder if I'm a just dead. As you I'm are, I'm not supposed I to be scared. Must am tell I? You I do sometimes I cry and sometimes I shake, wondering, isn't it true that the strong never break? I'm not lying. Just fine, exactly the way you are. The way I look? Yes. The way I talk? <laughs> yes. The way I love? Especially that. You don't think I'm a mistake? You're the tiger I love most in this whole universe. Oh, thanks, Lady Evelyn. I love you. I forgot to say thank you to Adam and Mindy for filling in for Leo and Grant today. So thank you guys for being the AV folks today. Appreciate it. Isn't it true that the strong never break? Show of hands, how many of you think it's true that the strong never break? 
Absolutely not. Right before Rogers died, he asked his wife, Am I a sheep? Referring to the parable of the sheep and the goats, where the sheep enter into the eternal peace of God, and the goats have some time in purgatory first. Even as beloved as Rogers was, as huge as his ministry's impact was, as saintly as he is seen by many, he wrestled with deep doubt over whether he was good enough for God's love. If he was worthy for Christ's eternal care. That is something within our Christian tradition, that overwhelming fear of God and not being good enough, that I think the church has to speak out loudly against. When you have someone like Mr. Rogers wondering if he himself, a pastor, a Presbyterian seminary trained pastor, wondering if he is good enough for Jesus, we have done something wrong to ourselves as teaching adults. That we teach our children better than we teach ourselves. And we need to take that back. And yet, it's hard because there is a biblical truth about it too. You are not enough. We are not enough. That's something super important that we all need to understand. I'm not saying we're not good enough in worldly standards like, boy, I wish I was taller. Or uh, that one girl who said, I don't really like to date short guys or pastors. <laughs> I'm not talking about money or business or uh, having things or success. I'm saying we aren't good enough to save the world on our own personal singular efforts. And we need to understand that that we aren't good enough to do that, we can't do that, we will never be good enough to do that, and we weren't created to do that. God is good enough. We can join with Christ in that salvific work. In fact, Jesus asks us to explicitly do that, but we aren't good enough to do it all ourselves. We offer our efforts, but they feel rightly feeble in the face of the daunting task of righting all the wrongs of the world. So we aren't enough. And that might sound horrible to say to a whole bunch of people as we end a sermon series on Mr. Rogers who proclaimed everyone was good enough in some ways but it's actually a blessing. It's a relief. We don't even have to try to be enough because God already has that covered for us. It's the Redeemer's job to redeem. It's the Savior's job to save. It's the Spirit's job to comfort and to teach. It's our job to be vessels to be tools, to be teachers, to be guides, to offer our lives as imperfect as they are and let God do the rest. I love this truth that I read in a, in a devotion that's stayed with me. It says, it's where our own abilities and efforts end. It's where our own abilities and efforts end. That God's love truly shines through. 
like Leonard Cohen wrote the song that, or the poem where it's in the cracks, in the broken places where the light shines through. And I love the freedom that brings. I love that we can quit beating ourselves up for not being perfect. We're not Methodist after all. I, they believe in the doctrine of perfection for you recovering Methodists. It's something that they believe in. And as Calvinists, uh, Presbyterians, Reformed people, we say, no, no. Only God is perfect. So we are freed. And we can give up on trying to be something that we will never be. We can focus instead on what we are naturally good at and ask God and others to help us in the places where we are not so strong. In our first reading today, we heard Moses cross-examine God. He questions God for choosing himself to be a messenger to Pharaoh. And Moses says, who am I to go to Pharaoh? I stutter. I don't speak eloquently. And God said, I know. I made you. It's funny, if you keep reading that passage, you, you see probably what would have become one of the first emojis in Scripture. And it's God doing a face palm. doing a face palm at the reluctance of Moses to be his messenger. But Moses wasn't the only leader in scripture who struggled with self-worth. Paul over and over boasted about what a mess he was. And he loved to boast about that because it allowed him to boast even more about how amazing God was and that God could use even him and bring these great fruit out of what he offered. Paul had a rigid personality. He had a temper and he had physical ailments. And yet, his efforts to proclaim Christ's love were multiplied despite all of his faults and fears. Nearly every single person mentioned in the Bible was a tragic failure on some level. David murdered and cheated. Jonah ran. Elijah couldn't hold himself together. Peter was a rock. Andy denied Jesus right after he said, I would never deny you. And the list goes on and on. Psalm 145 reminds us that God is the one who upholds us in our weakness. When we stumble, God picks us up. When we fall and we can no longer hold ourselves up, God becomes our strength. He uses our mistakes, our failures, and whatever we offer and uses those things to work together all things for something good. No one in the Bible was good enough by our culture's standards. And it's a good thing too, I think. Because if any of those people, if any of the heroes in the Bible had actually been good enough, we would be more likely to look at them instead of God. But instead we say, oh my gosh, look at these people. How did God do all of this through them? And it amazes us, and we turn and we give thanks to God for that. That's why I think it's important that we never fall victim or we become wary of falling victim to the myth that we can be good enough. We will always find disappointment in little things about ourselves. I love that in that video that Daniel Tiger does not give up his brokenness. You notice how Lady Elaine is trying to take it away over and over. It's like when I used to say to my sisters, do I look fat in this? And they would say, no. And finally, I had one of my friends say to me, well, yeah, because you are. <laughs> like, 
maybe you should diet and exercise. Right? And Mr. Rogers won't let it be taken away. He is owning his brokenness in that regard. She's trying to lift him up, rightfully so, but he is saying, no, I am broken. This is who I am. It is a part of what I am. And yet, we know that God used him, despite all of that brokenness that he felt in his heart, that we are still listening to what I believe is the wisdom of Christ taught through Mr. Rogers. He did that whole, that whole 30 year series as a ministry to teach about the love of Jesus. In a song sung frequently on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, he reminded the television neighbors, sometimes people are good and they do just what they should. But the very same people who are good sometimes are the very same people who are also bad. It's funny, but it's true. It's the same, isn't it, for me and for you? However tempted we may be to say, I am bad, or others are bad, or I am good, or others are even better, all of us are more and less than we seem. Fred Rogers said that one of his favorite quotes was this. This is French. Le essential est invisible pour les you. In English, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And what is essential in our life of faith is the offerings we make. What is essential is our willingness to say, here I am, Lord, use me. It's a prayer that reverses the idea of you doing all the work to instead you making yourself with all your imperfections available. And that for God, is good enough. So may we again this day offer our lives back to God. Here we are, Lord. Use us. Use us for your mercy and for your glory. And may we not ask who was our neighbor, but may we first strive to be the embodiment of your perfect love. May we first be a good neighbor. In Christ's name, amen.